episode of Girl Influence Power is brought to you by Collectin. Shop or run the world's tiniest boutiques with Collectin. Welcome to Girl Influence Power Podcast. I'm your host, Nadia Lee, entrepreneur, jewelry designer, CEO, co-founder of Collectin, an app that lets you shop influencer and designer labels direct from the source. Thank you for tuning in Life on CastBox. This episode is brought to you by Collectin. Shop the world's tiniest boutiques in partnership with CastBox. For those tuning in to our podcast for the first time, what is Girl Influence Power? This is my podcast dedicated to interviewing influential women, whether she's an entrepreneur, a business leader, an influencer, or a public figure to explore the common thread that binds us together and makes us the kind of women we are today. Today, we have the beautiful and fearless woman in our studio, Louise Grasmer. Louise is a powerful businesswoman and impactful influencer in her area of work. She currently heads LMG Public Relations, a strategic communications consulting firm in Los Angeles. Her firm specializes in crisis communication, messaging, and public uh, agency policy, branding, change management, executive coaching, and communication planning. Louise herself is also a national strategic consultant for Casey Family Programs, the country's largest operating foundation focused on safely reducing the need of foster care across America. Louise assists the foundation and agencies throughout the country with its mission to provide, improve, and ultimately prevent the need for foster care. Prior to starting out on her own, Louise previously served as the Director of Communication for the L.A. County Department of Children and Family Services, the largest child welfare agency in the country. She has over 25 years of experience in journalism and communications, working in newspapers, magazines, Fortune 500 companies, government, and nonprofit organizations. Her career includes 17 years working in the field of national child welfare, helping organizations and executives with advocacy, strategic communications, and thought leadership. On her spare time, Louise is also a social media influencer with an engaging blog and Instagram handle known as Cursing Ballerina. From her blog name, you can guess, Louise has a passion for ballet as well as making an impact on empowering women with fun and fashionable lifestyle advice for women over 40s. Welcome, Louise. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> thanks Thanks for coming, yeah. <laughs> especially after such challenging times and yeah. we've not had a guest in a long time. Um, anyway, we'll get started. Um, so before we get into something deep, I just want to know like um, a little bit more about you. Okay, so when did you know you love ballet and how did you get started and how did you get into it? So... I had always loved ballet since I was a child. Oh. Um, I would say the interest was I was very young, mm-hmm. but I couldn't um, take classes uh-huh. when I was younger. It mm-hmm. was just really expensive right. and you know, time consuming. It mm-hmm. wasn't something that um, that I could do right. as a kid. Mm-hmm. So when I turned 40, um, I started to kind of run that bucket list, Uh, you know, mm -hmm. through my head (laughs) and like, what have I always wanted to do that I have never done? Yeah. And so ballet was on that list. Oh, nice. And I just got up the courage, went to an adult class, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. knew nothing, didn't even know what first position was, nothing. Um, and went to an adult class and that's how it started. Wow. And nice. Yeah. I couldn't tell. Yeah. <laughs> like I look at you, you. like your pose and you look really professional. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You look really good. <laughs> no, I started as an older adult. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's nice because ballet is all about dedication, very physical, very mental. Yeah. So what, what's your ethos growing up? Um, I know you're a marathon runner, so there must be some kind of consistency between the both that are very similar, right? Yeah, I think there is definitely a ballet personality. Uh-huh. Oh, really? <laughs> I think so, um, especially in the adult community, mm-hmm. because it's like you said, it's really difficult, right, and it right. takes a lot of dedication, right, and right. it's very strenuous. Right. Um, so I would say that you know I'm a Type A personality, uh-huh. ah, perfectionist. Right, right, right. Um, so those kind of qualities help right, with right, ballet. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm very disciplined. Oh, right. So the training for the marathons is all about discipline. That's you true. have to commit to the training. That's true. Otherwise, you know, you're not going to make it those 26 miles. Right. Um, so yeah, all of that kind of fits into my 
personality that right, I already have. Right, right, right. So yeah. how, many, how, many, how many times a week or how much time do you have to put into ballet um, normally? When I was first starting, I only did like one class a week. Uh-huh. And then it kind of increased over the years to a couple times a week. Ah, nice. And now I do point work. Uh-huh, so I'm uh-huh. in the point shoes. Ah, um, nice. So that's a little bit more challenging mm-hmm, and that mm-hmm. requires more time because you have to keep up your right, strength. Right, right. That's true. That's yeah. True. Oh, nice. Okay, so let's talk about you. Uh, I know you're born and raised in L.A. So what's the world like in L.A. growing up? Um, yeah, it's changed a lot. I actually live in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Oh, really? Yes. Still? Wow. Yes. That's very rare. <laughs> yes, it is very rare. But you must um, see lots of changes. I see lot. I've seen lots of changes. Right. Um, what's kind of interesting is I grew up in, you know, in the middle of the city, but mm-hmm. I had kind of a Mayberry kind of idyllic Ah, um, mm-hmm. growing up on my street, uh-huh. we all knew each other. The kids ah, played together. Mm-hmm. It was kind of that environment. Right, 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 People right. hung around for 20 years. Right, you right, know. Right. Um, so now it's much more transitory. That's true. People are that's in true. and out. That's true. Um, and you can kind of see the generational shifts. Right. That's true. So now more families are actually moving in. Ah, so where we went through families. Yeah. We went through a period where it was all young people mm-hmm. and things like that. So, um, I've seen it economically change right, right. Um, racially change mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah do you still know your neighbors yeah I mean I still know my neighbors but you know probably not as much as growing up <laughs> that's you know true, I, that's I like true. to say that I know the floor plan of right. every house on, oh, really? on my block because oh. I've been in every house <laughs> wow that's nice yeah so it's like you know oh that's very nice yeah do you have any female role models growing up um well, I'm going to say the obvious, my mother. Right. <laughs> that seems to be the obvious. Yes. yes. <laughs> Consistency, um, though. Yes. Um, but I, you know, I grew up in, in, as a child and a teen in the 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the time of, of the Gloria Steinem and right. the women's movement right, in the right, 70s. Right. And then we got into the 80s. And I remember vividly one of my first um, women that I admired was Geraldine Ferraro. Uh huh. Right. And she ran mm-hmm. for vice president. Right. Right. In 1984. Right. And I remember. I just, I, yeah, I was 14 years old, and I remember seeing her and thinking, "Wow, a, a woman is running for <laughs> right. vice president. You know, this That's is amazing. True. That's true. Yeah. So I would say that was probably a really early influence. <laughs> right. You right, know? right. I think we're pretty much the same generation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's funny because I remember the, the big, big hair. Yes, the, the big hair. Oh, and I remember all the neighborhoods. Like you, you could literally go to anyone's house and the door yeah. is always open. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, were your parents very impactful on shaping you to become who you are today? Yes. I mean, I, I, I grew up with two parents who were born in the, you know, into the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, products of World War II right, generation. Right, right. And I think that is a totally different mm-hmm. way of thinking. Right. Um, so I think it absolutely shaped how I view money, uh, <laughs> how I view saving, right, right. how I view, um, you know, cash versus credit, right. you know, all of those kind of things. That's true. Um, That's true. You know, stricter parents probably mm-hmm. than most people had because my parents were also older uh, okay. when they had me uh-huh, which was uh-huh. kind of unusual for that time ah uh, okay so I had older stricter parents right right um I didn't have the hippie parents of the 70s <laughs> it might be a good thing yeah yeah so I would say those are you know ways they impacted me right and I know you love to write so you started writing at 12 um, you were a little reporter for LA uh, Children's Museum. So yes. how did that come about? So yeah, I was in the sixth grade and my sixth grade teacher um, noticed my writing ability. Ah. And she had a connection with the Children's Museum mm-hmm. and they, they were looking for youth reporters. Oh, cute. And so <laughs> and yeah. Smart too. Yeah. yeah. And so she, they had a little newspaper called LA Kids. Oh, okay. I don't know if they still have it, but mm-hmm. um, she recommended me. Ah. And um, that's how it happened. And I would go on these like legitimate, like little interviews with like, (laughs) you know, I interviewed Henry Winkler. I interviewed Neil Diamond. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it was it was crazy. Wow. That's very legit. (laughs) Yeah, it was very legit. Yeah. (laughs) So how do you know that's what you wanted to do? Journalism. 
I think I just knew from a really young age because prior to that, I remember I got like a tape recorder uh-huh. when I was about eight years old mm-hmm. and I would go around and do like these mock tape interviews like with my brother and like oh. with driving nuts <laughs> and like, you know, just do these like fake interviews. Right, and, right, right, right. And so I, you know, I can't say I really know where exactly that right, seed right. was planted, right. but it started very young. So do you feel like that's the n- nature or nurture? That passion or that... Um, I think it was nature. I think I was an inquisitive child. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And then with practice, it gets better and more honed in right, yes. over the years. Yes. That's nice. Um, so you continue to write all the way through high school. You're an editor of your high school m- newspaper, right? Yes. So, um, like, did you have a plan of where you wanted to go back then? Like, with your, like, moving forward into your adulthood? Yes. I wanted to be a newspaper reporter. Ah. Um, that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very firm about it. I was one of those kids that entered college knowing what my major was. Oh, well, wow. <laughs> that's and very a, rare. Yeah, and had a very, that's the type A. Okay. And had a very clear path right. of what I wanted to do. Right. And so, um, yeah, I just started on that journey. Okay, so you believe education is very important then. Yeah. Okay, so now a lot of kids, and this is probably good to, for kids to listen. Sure. <laughs> Do you think, you know, I mean, because all this news out there about, wow, you know, so-and-so dropped out of school and they didn't finish their education, but they had this major startup and they're super successful. What's your view on having an education before you actually start something? Um, well, I kind of have a mixed view on that. I think it's really important to still get a four year degree. Uh Um, I think that that helps you in life and it opens doors. Right. Uh, but I also believe in seizing opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you're young and you're given an amazing opportunity, then you should take that life path. Right. Right. Yeah. And really, I think everyone should really evaluate who they are as well. Like, you know, yeah, not everybody is a a four year university (laughs) person. I mean, maybe they're a trade school person. Person. That's true. That's you know, true. I mean, that's true. maybe they're an art school person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I know you spent over 25 years in journalism and communications. So do you feel like there were, there were limitations to having a career in those fields as a woman? I definitely think I realized in the early days that um, for me personally, being a reporter would probably be limiting uh, okay. um, for me lifestyle wise. Okay. Uh, because it you know, it's, it's very hard. It's right. very time consuming. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got to be like your entire life. Ah. This is only speaking from my own experience, right, what right. I witnessed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I kind of had to start reevaluating if that's really what I wanted ah. because, you know, the fantasy right, of what a career right. is yes. versus when the you get reality. out into the real world <laughs> that's is true. different. That's true. Yeah. But though, do you feel like there was a difference also between men and women or that's not necessarily a big thing? For um, you, back I mean. back then, back then yeah. yeah, I think that there was a huge difference. Okay, um, you know, as far as how women and men were treated in that profession, right? right. Oh, absolutely. Okay, all right. So, what what advice do you have for women stepping out, like in you know, into a career of journalism, for example, nowadays? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, explore different options, find out what topics and what areas you're really interested in Mm -hmm. and maybe try to develop a niche in that topic. That seems to be where a lot of the media is now. Right. Um, not many people are generalists anymore. (laughs) People are all specialists, right? That's true. That's very true. Yeah. So I would say find out what you're really passionate about writing about, like whether or not it's the law or Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. social justice, you know, whatever that is and seek out those opportunities. Right. And also the traditional channels have changed so tremendously. So you really could be on your own or doing something different than what it normally was, you know, back yeah, in the Yeah, you can just submit things to online publications. Ah. You know, mm-hmm, instead mm-hmm. of having to have a full-time job at right. that publication. Right, so right, right. There, I just think there's a lot more opportunity now. Now, that's true. Yeah. That's true. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And there's different ways of doing things, you know, like kind of out of the box. Yes. Yeah, and methods. more acceptance for the out of the box thinking. Right, right, Which is right. good. Right, right. That's true. That's yeah. true. Um, so I know you also work for a lot of Fortune 500 companies, government, nonprofit and you know there's probably lots of lots of red tape so what's your secret in like climbing like corporate ladder so every time I made a move Mm -hmm. from a job it was a move up ah okay so it was pretty strategic Uh um, as far as responsibility right 
uh, pay, right. title. Mm-hmm. So I would say that's probably, as a woman, important to look at. Right. Um, to know your worth, to know right. what kind of salary you want, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and to make sure that you get it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and to not be afraid to be the boss. Right. That's true. And, you know, a lot of young people, like, they feel, or, or I've seen or heard from friends and myself <laughs> with a lot of employees as well, um, they tend to like to jump from job to job very frequently mm-hmm. because they feel like it's not the right fit. Do you feel like, do you have an advice or opinion on that? Like, how would, because, you know, every time you jump, you're saying strategically, you do it to move up. Yeah. Not just to move across. Or exactly. <laughs> or try, you know, yeah. Like, I did a lot of jumping around in right. my, in my twenties. Uh-huh. Um, part of that was financial and uh-huh, I just uh-huh. wanted to make more money right. to survive. <laughs> um, but it was strategic. Right. You know, right. I didn't just look for jobs that were lateral. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I, I, I collected all of my experience and moved up. Right. So I would say that probably is the be- is one of the best ways to go. Okay. All right. So there's this big tidal wave of the Me Too movement. So do you think it's really actually helping us as women or it's actually creating some kind of unforeseen setback? Oh, I think it's helping. Right. I think mm-hmm. any time that you raise awareness mm-hmm. about these issues, right. it's a good thing. And I think everything that's come out about, you know, pay equity right. and things like that, it's, yeah. It, right. That's it, true. Let's get the discussion. Let's keep going. Right. That's true. And if it's not brought to the forefront. Yeah. <laughs> like and we've been talking about this a long time. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there is some progress. <laughs> yeah. There is some progress. Yeah. But, but I, we have to keep talking about it. Right. Yes. Otherwise, it won't move forward. Yes. And I agree. We can't, we can't just ignore it. It won't go away. Yeah. Yes. All right. So we're going to take a little break and we'll be back with Louise. Now you can try before you buy on Collectin. Introducing Experience, the new way to shop jewelry. Flaunt your style and express your creativity with Experience. Get it today, only on Collectin. And we're back with Louise Grasper. Okay, we're going to jump right in and talk about other things. <laughs> We've been chatting all morning. Okay, so I know your social handle is Cursing Ballerina. So what does that mean? <laughs> uh, there's actually a funny story behind that. Oh, really? <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, so um, early on when I was taking class, uh, I've been known to let an expletive mm-hmm. fly out of my mouth, which is not really correct etiquette in uh-huh, ballet class. Uh-huh. Um, teachers don't really like it, so I don't recommend, but it does happen. So one time I came home and I told my husband, I said, well, I guess I'm the cursing ballerina. (laughs) And I told him what happened and it just stuck. I was like, that's Ah, me. That's a nice handle name. name. It's very, very, very like catchy. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. I also love the mix of the hard and the the soft. Mm -hmm. Ah, right, 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 right. And it has like a masculine feminine feel to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, it's really hard to come up with a name, especially that's going to represent you as a brand. Yeah, it was just really organic. Ah, that's nice. Uh, So do you think yourself as an influencer? And what does that word influencer mean to you? Yeah, I don't really think of myself as an influencer, which is kind of odd. Um, (laughs) Well, you influence. Yeah, I know. I don't really like that word that much. I know. I agree. It's weird. Yeah, there's a lot of negative connotation. Yeah. Yeah, It's overused, I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I I just feel more that um, if you are your authentic self, then people will want to follow you. Agree. Yeah. So I, I just believe in being authentic and you know, in conveying the life advice mm-hmm. that I've gathered so far right, uh, right. in my time on this earth. <laughs> and I'm not really into preaching and telling people what to do, just that this has worked for me or this is what I like to do right, and share it. Right. So I think of myself more as a creator uh-huh, right. than an influencer. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Yeah. 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 Um, so how did you venture into blogging? And, another you know, yeah. another funny story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, ten years ago, I wanted to learn how to blog. Ah. I was starting up my business, mm-hmm, and I'm mm-hmm. like, I need to like learn more about how to do right, this. So right. my first blog was actually a food cooking blog. Oh, because I love cooking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I got into it. Right. And then I decided I don't really like doing this because I like to cook, but I don't like 
chronicling the whole process. <laughs> it's very tedious. Right. It is very tedious. Yeah. And and then I just fell into kind of the fashion thing because mm-hmm. I'd always loved clothes. Right. And that was a better fit for me. Yeah. So I just transitioned. Oh, that's nice. It's, no, you have a great sense of style. Thank you. Like for the people who are not seeing on video, she looks <laughs> nice every time. Thank you. <laughs> that's why I'm like, yes, the very fashionable <laughs> Louise. <laughs> um, anyway, so do you think there is a lack of representation in the social media for your age group? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, It's something that, you know, I kind of try to work on Mm -hmm. because I feel like not only is there a lack of representation, the representation is not inclusive. Right. So basically every image you see of a, quote, mature woman, Uh the woman has to have gray hair, (laughs) you know? And it's like, it's not that there's anything wrong with that. Like at some point I am going to go gray also. yeah, Yeah. But when that's all there is. Right. That's true. To represent a woman over like the age of 50. That's there's true. There's a problem with that. That's true. I agree. Because fashion means a lot to you, right? I mean, yeah. tell us about your perspective on fashion. I think fashion is self-expression. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you say a lot through your clothes. Right, right. You know, how you're feeling that day, what you oh, want to portray, right. yeah. uh, what you think about yourself. Mm-hmm. Even um, that confidence, right? Confidence. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. It's not everything, but <laughs> um, I view it as kind of an art form. Right. No, I agree. Because uh, when I have a big event and I dress nicely, I feel more confident. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I think it, it helps, you know, that whole, yeah, sure. dressing nicely and dressing powerfully. I think that's very important. Yeah. Especially as a woman. <laughs> yeah. Because I know you're a big, huge fan of none another fashion platform which i'm not going to mention but i I know uh so what drew you to collecting in the first place i'm always curious (laughs) like how did you find us so i found you guys because i came to a women's empowerment event here Ah, at your headquarters oh wow we've had that was a while ago yeah it was a while ago and it was really a fun day oh yeah and you spoke oh yes i remember yeah and i was like i like this woman (laughs) and i just went up to you after after the thing and I was like I want to be an influencer with collected and you're like you looked at my Instagram you're like okay <laughs> let's do it yeah I know we we're starting out then I was yeah thinking, I think that was you're the starting. first that's the first time I spoke in front of an audience of uh you know all these content creators yeah. and beautiful women and I love like, the fact yeah. that collecting is woman owned right and you know that's lots true. of women are working oh, here yes, and the yes. products are beautiful oh, and I only you. like to influence you know with brands that I believe in. Right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Which is important because I feel sure. like in Instagram, there's so much, especially nowadays, right there. Well, especially in the past, I would say it's changing now, but there's a lot of people sponsoring products that they don't really like. They just sure. get paid for it. And yeah. it's not genuine. And yeah. I, and, and I think, your audience will really lose interest. You know, we start posting stuff that's not you. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. So anyway, with COVID, we're all dressing really way too comfortably at home. So what do you think fashion is going to be like now we're returning back into the working world or the real world? I think there's probably going to be a renewed effort to be comfortable, but <laughs> fashionable. Right, right, right. You know, uh, I think a little bit of that was starting already. That's true. The athleisure category. Yeah, the category. athleisure category. Yeah, that's true. Um, but it will be interesting to see because maybe we will swing back to overdressing. That's true. Because I agree. we've been dressing in leggings and sweats for right. a year or That's whatever. That's true. I mean, I'm totally dressed up today. Like, yeah. I have a dress on. Yeah, me too. On. And it feels great, right? Yep. <laughs> My nanny was shocked. <laughs> I was like, whoa, where are you going? <laughs> no, it, it feels good. And then actually, like, during, you know, I, I subscribe to Stitch Fix. <laughs> I'm, uh-huh. not, I'm trying, not trying to plug them, but um, like, over the stay at home, and usually I don't keep all of the products, but this time I actually kept like three out of five. Yeah. And then the stuff that I kept wasn't like all the comfort stuff. It was actually the heels, you know? Yeah. Like the stuff that I imagine myself wearing when I return back to work. Yes. Because I didn't want to feel like I'm just going to get another, like another sweat, you know, another piece of something that was comfortable. But yeah. anyway, so it's, you're right. It could really go the other way. And yeah. I can't wait because I feel like we're all dressing a little too sloppy lately. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I think that's, you know, that's part of that whole personal style thing. <laughs> that's true. Right? That's true. Um, uh, we were talking about crisis management earlier, so I know you are really good at that. So what's like a definite no-no when like a company or brand is facing a crisis or even now, like what would you advise people like during COVID times? Don't lie. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's really hard for some people yeah. who represent the Don't country. lie. <laughs> Here's my two main words of advice. Right. It, especially <laughs> for all, you know, the young women out there who are representing their brands right, also. Right, that's true. Number one is be authentic. Right, I agree. And number two is if you ever get into trouble with any any kind of situation, don't lie about it. Right, that, that I agree. Yeah. yeah. Because people can sense when you're not being truthful or honest. Exactly. Or Just when, own it. Yeah, that's and true. And try to rectify it. Right. And I feel like you should talk to your audience, you yes. know, I think especially on social media. So with, with social media, there's always this two camps. Either people are way too careful when it comes to key issues or they just don't even talk about it, just grace it over. Um, how do you feel a brand or a person you know, who has a lot of social media influence should straddle, straddle between the two. I really think that's a personal decision mm -hmm. and that goes to your comfort level. Right. But I also believe that if you are an influencer with a giant um, audience, mm -hmm. that you have a responsibility right. to speak up when injustice is happening. Right. Right. Um, so I, I also believe in that. Right. Uh, but as far as like what organizations you want to get involved mm -hmm, with, what mm -hmm. causes, mm -hmm. I think that all goes to you personally. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Because there was a lot of backlash recently, you know, when certain influencers didn't speak up about what their views were. That was really interesting to watch. Right. It was for me kinda, online. Right. It was kind of odd. Right. Because the whole I, black square thing. Right. 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 Yeah. And then I, I had some influencers were telling me like, hey, I'm actually afraid to go out today because yeah. people were sending me threatening messages or, you know, making really nasty comments. And I was like, wow, I, I didn't even. And she's like, well, I'm even a woman of color. It's not yeah. like you know, but it's, it's really hard because I yeah. think people you have to be brave and you right, have to know right, that right. when you make a statement like that, this is what I always tell my clients. These are what the consequences are going to be. That's true. So That's it's a true. risk of evalu evaluation. Like, right. do you want to deal with these consequences? Right. Because no. this is what's going to happen. Right. Um, I agree. So, wow, you're really brave because at 40, you started your own PR firm. So did people think you were crazy? I mean, what yes. came about? What was the turning point? <laughs> well, I had a really kind of secure job, government mm -hmm. job, which supposedly nobody ever leaves. Right. That's true. I'm like, what? <laughs> and uh, I left <laughs> um, at 40 in the middle of a re major recession. Oh, really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> So people yeah. thought you were crazy. Yes, <laughs> people thought I was crazy. Uh, it was just the timing for me in my personal mm -hmm, life mm -hmm. was right. Ah, okay. Uh, I had always wanted to open my own shop, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it was just a matter of timing. Right. Uh, and so I took the leap, and my husband encouraged me. Oh, nice. And that's how it happened. That's true. It's important It's important to have a support system, so yeah. that's really nice. Can you tell us a little bit of what your LMG PR firm does? Sure. Uh, so I work uh, mainly right now with large government agencies mm -hmm. and nonprofits that deal with child welfare. So oh, that's okay. the foster care right. system right. throughout the country, which is very interesting right. um, business to be in. Mm -hmm. I have learned a lot in the last like 15 years Wow. because mm -hmm. I knew nothing about this coming really? into the county job. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was a big learning curve. Um, so I... I basically help them with strategizing their communications, mm -hmm. so how to talk better to their clients, um, their internal audiences, right, their right. stakeholders, right. how to get public support for their policies. Uh, that's important. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. all of that. So oh, nice. crisis communications, obviously. Right. So, so all a your, lot of different things. Right, right, right. So all your journalism experience yeah. really all just kind of came together. Yeah, media this. relations right. is a big part of right. it. Right. So it all just falls in place. You just knew it was right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, anything about like uh, you want to give people like uh, a little inside of what it's like to be a business owner? Um, what are some of the freedoms or trade offs or, you know, that you get as a business owner versus you were working for someone else before um, or share some of your <laughs> stories? Yeah. So, you know, the one of the pros of being your own 
business owner is obviously all of your time is your own. Right. So that is a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side to that is you have to be very disciplined with how you use that time. That's true. Yeah. So uh, I would say discipline is is key, um, but that is definitely one of the pros. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other thing you have to think about when you want to start your own business is that you always have to be hustling. I know we talk about this, the the hustle, right? (laughs) Right, The hustle is real. Yes. Yeah. It's real. (laughs) It's every day. (laughs) It's every day trying to find new clients, trying to find new opportunities, saying yes to most everything, (laughs) you know, I mean, so you have to drum up your own business. It's not just coming to you. Yeah, that's true. And then do you think about business all the time? I try not to. Right. But it's probably, you know, I'm a consistent warrior, <laughs> so it's probably always there. Do you bring it home to your husband? <laughs> yeah, probably too much. <laughs> but he's an opposite personality of me, so oh, he, that's he's nice. very chill. That's nice. No, because it's important because, you know, it's hard. It's yeah. hard to have your own business. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know that. Oh, I know that. <laughs> yeah, I'm preaching to the choir here. Yes, yes. It's like 24-7 and never stops, yeah. you know? And then even my daughter's like, Mom, you need to stop talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you really need to know to make that differentiation between work and life yes. um, and then make, to make it work. So that's nice. That's very nice. So how do you what, how do you have time to spend with your friends or do you dedicate a certain amount of time? Yeah, I, I, I still try to keep my weekends free, uh-huh. like a normal job, okay. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm on deadline, obviously right, I, I right. work. Mm-hmm. But so, you know, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of happy hours right. and when we could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, yeah, I just make time. Oh, that's nice. I, I also always make time for physical activity. Mm-hmm. I think that exercise is really important. Right. And I've believed in that since I was a teenager. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's good. So now beyond ballet, what other obsessions or massive life goals do you have that's still on your bucket list <laughs> that you want to achieve in the coming years? Oh, gosh. You know, get through this COVID period. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's on the, the list. Um, um, I would say I just want to grow my business. Mm-hmm. Um Probably I'm looking into doing some online courses. Ah, okay. So maybe to going, share your knowledge. Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be kind of the next step. Right, right, right. And that's a big, that's your big arena that's actually picked up so much yes. during the COVID times because yes. people want to learn and they want to learn at home. <laughs> yes, know? exactly. And it's convenient. Right, right. And now yeah. everyone's so used to being at home. It's probably a good time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so looking- I thought, you know, yeah, the timing is right. So let's try that. Yeah. And the technology is good too nowadays too. It makes it really easy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every year it seems like it gets better and better or more complicated and more complicated. That's true. <laughs> However way you want to see yeah. it. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you so much for coming. We're so happy to have you on my thank show. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. <laughs> I know. It's been a while. I haven't seen you since like January, is it? Or no, March. No, March. Yeah, we were just right talking before. about it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> but it's glad. It's, it's so nice to see people. <laughs> yes, it is. So nice to see you yeah thank you for coming and thank you for joining us and sharing your amazing story so Louise is super inspirational for women women starting out on their own and um, all these stories really could help empower young women to go go for it and really be fearless so for all of you out there who haven't followed Louise on IG at cursing ballerina do it now or you can subscribe to our newsletter on, or read her blog at www.thecursingballerina.com. If you enjoy our podcast today, please subscribe to our podcast and check out our videos on our website, girlinfluencepower.com and or on Collectin's YouTube channel. Well, there you have it, Louise Grasmer. Thank you for tuning in live today at Girl Influence Power, brought to you in partnership with Collectin and CastBox. Music